Thank you so much for the chance to talk to you today. It's a huge honor to be here um, talking to this, this group, and thank you, Carson. Um, my name is Lauren Young. I'm an assistant professor of political science at UC Davis, and I'm co-presenting this with Elaine Stecker, who's a research fellow at UCLA. When is research ethical, right? I think Carson did a great job of laying out the need for good evidence in, con in research on conflict, um, but we also want that research to follow ethical principles while we're doing it, right? And so I actually want to start with an example. Um, this is a hypothetical study, but something that you know, is in the line of things that are commonly done um, in uh, research on conflict. So imagine there's a study where a researcher surveys 2,400 Syrians recruited through an international NGO about their experiences during the conflict. During the consent process, she tells participants the study will cover violence and might make them upset, but their responses are confidential and they can refuse to participate if they want to. She offers each respondent $5. So just take a minute to think, right? Is this study ethical? Okay. And what I actually want to convince you of, what Elaine and I want to convince you of, is that it depends on the actual evidence that we might be able to observe and collect around things like whether consent was actually informed, right? Is it enough to tell someone that participating in a study might make them upset? Is that enough for them to make a really autonomous informed decision? Right? Is $5 a coercive amount in this situation or is that you know, an, an appropriate amount um, that compensates people for their time? Um, does participating in the study actually make people dis uh, distressed or you know, perhaps even exacerbate uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or things like that? Right? So, whether or not this study is ethical depends on things that we actually know how to measure, um, observe, and report on um, when we're doing this kind of research. Okay. And in the way that I just kind of picked apart that hypothetical example, um, there are a couple of themes, right? And these themes are research uh, principles or ethical principles that researchers across the board um, have kind of uh, agreed on and, and in some ways been held to since the late 1970s, right? So these are um, uh, principles of respect for persons or that people should be able to make an autonomous informed decisions about participation in research, beneficence or you know, that harm should be minimized and benefit should be uh, maximized to the extent possible for research participants, um, and justice or that you know, the same people who are paying the cost of participating in research should have access to the benefits. Right? Um, and of course, you know, those of you who know SIGA know that there is a kind of fourth ethical principle that uh, you know, is not part of um, the, uh, this, this exact uh, list, but um, that fourth principle is transparency, right? Um, and so what we want to convince you of today is that transparency around uh, research ethics is kind of the cornerstone that holds the rest of this edifice together and is uh, the kind of practice that we should be looking for as we you know, uh, try to make our um, our research in especially violence-affected areas um, more ethical um, going forward. Um, and unfortunately, the current research ecosystem um, does not, is not transparent enough to really ensure that, that research is always ethical, right? Um, and the lack of transparency around research ethics practices uh, means that there aren't strong enough incentives for ethical research um, and it also means that, you know, along the lines of what Carson was just saying, we don't have enough evidence to kind of be continuously improving the, um, the, the quality of our practices around research ethics, right? Um, so to, to give just a few examples, right, university institutional review boards, those of you who have worked with researchers or, you know, I know even at some NGOs there are um, university institutional review boards. Um, at least at the university level, they often have a slightly lower um, kind of threshold for what they will approve than what I think the people in this room would consider to be ethical, right? To give one example, they don't consider um, impacts on research staff, right? People like the interviewers who are participating in research. Um, and the publication process, right, which, you know, if you're working with academic partners, um, you know, the, that's one of the kind of main incentives that we have um, as, as academics um, to, to, you know, put good practices into place. But the publication process, unfortunately, usually doesn't consider research ethics. Um, so in some research that I've done with one of our other collaborators, um, Hannah Barron, we've actually looked at kind of uh, a number of influential political science journals only at uh, research that is um, involving human subjects and on a topic of conflict or violence, and only in a minority of research you know, articles and appendices um, is anything related to research ethics even reported. 
right? So usually this is not, research ethics is not a part of the publication process in a way that would enable the creation of incentives um, for researchers to be putting in place good practices, okay? Um, and so here, uh, I hope I haven't thoroughly depressed you, but I'm gonna hand it over to Elaine to um, tell you a bit about what we do know um, and what we can do going forward. Okay, so what can we do? Academics and practitioners obviously want to conduct effective ethical research, and we have a responsibility to. And so what we're really hoping to advance, and Lauren has alluded to, is that we really need to look at the evidence base. And that includes both collating and understanding the existing evidence that we have, and also creating new evidence to inform the ethical decision-making process. So obviously, the question of ethical research is important across all domains, but of particular interest to our research team and probably most people in this room is how to conduct ethical research in conflict-affected areas. So our main research question is, what are the effects of asking about violence? How can you ask people about their experience of violence, conflict, or crime in a way that allows us to get the information that we need and informs policy in an effective way while making sure that these people, the participants, and as Lauren alluded to, the field staff, are not uh, incurring a lot of harms that we haven't foreseen. So our research team started off, as I've mentioned, with colluding some, um, collating some evidence, rather. And so over the past year, we've conducted a systematic review of peer-reviewed and working papers that uh, empirically and quantitatively measure the impact of participating in violence research. And I just want to give you kind of the findings from 10,000 feet. What we're seeing is that there's mostly net positive reactions. And that's to say, when we look at the balance of costs and benefits, we're seeing that benefits tend to win out in most of these papers. And when they don't win out, we're kind of seeing a neutral response. We do want to flag, though, that that doesn't mean that people are not experiencing discomfort. A lot of participants are reporting emotional responses to participation in violence research, such as feeling distressed or having thoughts that they would have rather not had. However, we're not seeing this translate to regret. They're not saying, oh, I would not want to participate in this kind of research in the future. So how do we understand negative affect? How do we understand its relationship to regret? How are we conceiving of harms? And in those times that we do see harm and regret, we're not seeing those effects persist. Of course, not all studies had long-term follow-ups. It was only about half of these papers, but in the evidence we do have and we can bring to bear, we're not seeing a long-term effect on participants that is worrisome. So that was the good news. Now here's a little bit of bad news, is that this evidence isn't always relevant to the context that most people in this room would be most interested in. So for most of the studies, they're occurring in the US and in other weird contexts, and weird being um, Western, educated, industrialized, rich democracies. So only two of the studies in our systematic review occurred outside of a weird context. A lot of the studies are coming from psych psychological literature, and so we're seeing a lot of focus on interpersonal violence and not so much focus on conflict and broader, more collective violence. Um, women are overrepresented in a lot of these studies, particularly due to their focus on sexualized violence in a lot of cases. And as I mentioned, we're not seeing a lot of consistent long-term measurement. So taken together, this presents quite a large evidence gap that we should really be thinking about filling. And so we've started to. Members of our research team have conducted three experiments in two different contexts in Nigeria, and we've presented the results on the right-hand side of the screen. Taken together, these experiments <coughs> suggest that we're not seeing mental health harms being done in this research asking about violence. We're not seeing movement on anxiety, depression, or PTSD uh, indices, and uh, that's common for men and women. So. This evidence would suggest that we don't really have so much to worry about. However, we're doing a fourth study right now, and that study is finding some of these indicators are moved. So although we do have some reason to believe that we shouldn't be so worried, we also have a little bit of imprecision and conflicting evidence. And so this really implies the need for us to continue thinking about this question, to continue finding rigorous evidence, and to continue putting those best practices into place. And with that, I'll pass you back to Lauren. Okay, thank you so much, Elaine. Um, so I just wanna end by first telling you a little bit about where we're going from here, because you know, obviously we don't have enough evidence yet about the effects of participating in research on violence. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the kind of practices that we do recommend at this stage, right? Even though we're kind of still at early stages of gathering evidence here. Um, 
So I'm sorry these maps look uh, not, not great, um, but uh, the first step um, in kind of what we still plan to do um, to generate, uh, to fill this evidence gap is generate new evidence. Um, so we are um, running with support from the National Science Foundation and, um, and uh, IPA, a, a multi-site experiment testing for the effects of asking about violence on both respondents and interviewers. Um, and we're also collecting a rep representative sample of interviewers who have worked on violence research um, in three contexts, Mexico, Colombia, and Nigeria. Okay. Um, so the goal here is really to you know, start to fill that evidence gap. You know, in the process of doing that, um, we um, aim to develop a handbook of best practices um, that you know, we really see not as you know, kind of our ideas on how to do research ethically with human participants on, on violence, but um, as a kind of compendium of you know, best and emerging practices that people both in academia and also in you know, the kind of um, you know, public sector are, are starting to develop and use. Um, so you'll see at the end, we have a large group of kind of advisors and collaborators on this project. And if you're interested in participating as you know, a kind of advisor or collaborator and um, especially contributing to this handbook of practices around asking about violence, we would love to, um, to hear from you. And so you know, what, what might we do now, right? Uh, so we wanna kind of leave you with, with a couple thoughts. Um, so to go back to this idea of you know, both incentives and evidence, right, and how tra transparency kind of works together um, to, uh, to enable and incentivize us to kind of make and use better uh, methodologies around research ethics, um, you know, we would encourage um, the people in this room to make sure that ethics is a central part of, say, grant applications for evaluations, right? Um, subcontracting when um, you are, you know, looking for a da data collection firm to, um, you know, to collect data on a population that's been affected by violence, right? You know, at least in my experience, you know, it can sometimes come as an afterthought, right? Once you've chosen the partner that, you know, say I want to work with, um, you know, then you say, oh, and okay, by the way, what's your plan for, you know, kind of doing this work ethically? Um, but, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, really making it a kind of central part of the methodology of, um, of how to, you know, interact and collect data from populations um, that have experienced or are experiencing violence um, can help strengthen those incentives to really use top, you know, cutting methods cutting edge methodologies to try to better adhere to these ethical principles. Um, and, and, you know, last kind of for the academics, um, you know, this should be a central part of the review process, right? So there are some journals that have started to make um, research, research ethics, you know, part of the submission process. Um, some reviewers will start asking about this. Um, if you were one of those people, uh, thank you for doing that. Um, and we hope that other people will kind of follow your lead. Um, and finally, Right, the kind of through making um, you know, decisions about research ethics and methodologies about research ethics a more central part of you know, things like publications and reporting and grant applications, um, you know, we hope that this will start to develop a stronger evidence base right, around these kind of central questions. Right? In our research um, and evaluations uh, around violence, right, how, how can we actually minimize harms? Right? How can we actually maximize benefits in terms of you know, dignity or empowerment um, that people might feel when they participate in research on the things that they've lived through? How can we minimize regret um, so that people you know, don't feel exploited when they participate in um, in research on violence. Um, so thank you very much for the feedback that we hope that we'll, we'll get from you in the next few minutes. Thanks. I think we have two minutes for questions for Lauren and Elaine. I'm wondering if you could say a bit about like ethics appendices. This is something that I've encountered and something that our team is working on, but it doesn't seem that widespread. Yeah. We're wondering how useful it is as an exercise and kind of what are the key things to keep in mind as a research team. So we think that's an incredibly useful idea and we've, um, some of the advisory members we have wrote a paper on kind of the standards for ethics appendices generally. We think in conflict uh, settings specifically, there's probably a couple additional things that need to be reported on, right? Like, we're not worried in a typical you know, econ study um, about someone becoming distressed through the research. So yeah, we hope to kind of build on that and kind of make a more specific set of recommendations um, for ethics appendices. But I think that's exactly the kind of transparency that can create incentives and generate evidence. 
Um, so I noticed in the, in the list of things that you include in the kind of the, the factors and analyzing whether yeah. a research study is ethical or not, it didn't include anything about the expected benefit of the research. And I know this context, yeah. this issue came up in the context of the COVID human challenge trials, mm -hmm. that if you think there's a really yeah. big benefit of the trial, maybe you're willing to, to put people through more. Is that something that is discussed in this context? And how do you try to figure out what is the yeah. expected return on the project as a whole? That is such a great question. Um, and I think, um, you know, my understanding of kind of the I mean, you know, the Belmont report and the kind of history of research ethics is that it came out of a number of studies where, you know, the argument that the benefits of the research findings were so great that it was worth it to, um, you know, to, to sacrifice people who participated. So I think at, at this point, we, we would stay with that kind of um, status quo, uh, you know, normative judgment. Um, I, I do recognize with with COVID, you know, in, in some cases it, it can be justifiable, but I think, you know, once you open up that possibility that harm to participants, you know, at a more extreme level, you know, more than just minimal harm could be justified by really important findings. Um, it, it just seems like a slippery slippery slope. Um, so yeah, I think we, we are at the moment leading towards kind of sticking with the status quo that, you know, more than, min, than pretty minimal harm can't really be justified um, by the value of the findings. Thank you so much, you guys.